revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Good evening and welcome to our Sunday evening Bible study. It is Sunday, September the 6th, 2020. We're thankful tonight that you have an interest in studying the Bible, and we're so happy that you've chosen to, to join us as we open up the Word of God together. My name is Mark Howell. I'm the preacher for the Midway Church of Christ. I'd like to take this opportunity to invite you to be a part of one of our Sunday morning worship services. Uh, we're only meeting on Sunday mornings again for the current uh, situation of the, the COVID virus. But we do meet at 9.30 in the auditorium and at 10.30 in the fellowship hall. And we do this, of course, in order to, to have distance between everyone. And we're asking that everyone mask up so that everyone can, can do as best we can to be saved from the virus. Now, if you can't be with us on Sunday morning, let me invite you to join us for our Sunday morning streaming. Uh, we're not doing that live. Uh, we actually do a video of our worship service and then stream that on a week delay. And the reason for that is our internet capabilities are slow, and so uh, we need to do that in order to have uh, the best possible quality that we can. And so we invite you to, to join us for that. If you can't be with us, that begins at 9.30 on Sunday morning. And so all you'd need to do is uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel or go to Facebook. We post that on Facebook, and you can click the link and that will take you to the video. Uh, as we think about Wednesday night, uh, we just began a new video study this past Wednesday night, and we're excited about it. Uh, the title of our study is going to be For Such a Time as This. And what we're going to be doing is studying through the book of Esther, uh, and we'll be making some application from the book of Esther to today. And so we hope you'll join us on Wednesdays for that study. We begin that at 6.30. Uh, and again, that is on our YouTube channel. You can go to Facebook. And again, a link will be provided to that video from there. Now, as you know, we have been talking about the church over the past few Sunday evenings. And we've seen how much the church is important in getting the chain of God's truth to mankind. And we talked about that. We did an entire lesson on that. And not only that, but we've seen that it's important because Jesus was willing to, to die for it. He laid down His life for the church. We've also seen how the church is God's family, and so that makes it important to Him. And we've seen how the church is the temple of God, and not only does that make it important for Him, but it makes it important for us as well as we approach Him. Now tonight we want to continue to see some of the other things that the Bible teaches about the church. And what we're going to do tonight is to read some passages, make some observations, and, and then we'll answer some simple questions. We're going to be calling on you, our, our viewers, to, to answer some simple questions as we uh, look at these passages and we study through them together. And so tonight, I hope that you'll take out your copy of God's Word and, and study right along with us and, and look at it and, and read together as we read. Now, let's go ahead and jump right into our study tonight. Turn in your Bible to the book of Matthew chapter 16 at verse number 18. Matthew chapter 16 at verse number 18. And there Matthew records for us these words. This, these are the words of Jesus. He says, and I tell you, you're, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus had just talked to his apostles about the men who uh, were living in his day, and, and he asked them, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And so they gave him some answers, but then Jesus turns it right around and asked the apostles, who do you say that I am? And so in Matthew chapter 16 at verse 16, the Bible says, Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son 
of the living God. What we have in verse number 18 is Jesus' reply to to Peter as he has confessed him to be the Son of God. But from verse 18, the Bible tells us some very important things about the church. Now, here are a couple of questions that we need to think about in regard to what we read there in Matthew chapter 16 at verse number 18, where the Bible says, I tell you, you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Here's question number one. Who built the church? Who was it that built the church? The church that we want to be a part of. Who built the church? Well, we read in Matthew chapter 16 at verse number 18 that Jesus said, I will build my church. And so to answer the question, we know that the one who built the church, we're not talking about the building, we're talking about the church, the people. The one who built that is Jesus. Now, question number two. To whom does the church belong? Now think about again what we read in the book of Matthew chapter 16 at verse number 18. The Bible says that Jesus said to Peter that he would build, he said, I will build my church. When Jesus said he would build his church, was he not claiming ownership of that church? And so as we answer the question, to whom does the church belong, we'd have to answer that question with Jesus as well. I will build my church. Now here's question number three from looking at Matthew chapter 16 at verse number 18. These things are not, uh, uh, not hard for us to, to grasp. They are in plain English and we understand them very easily. But as we look at question number three, did Jesus build my churches, plural, or did he build my church, singular? Now, if you need to look at it again, I hope you'll do that in your own copy of the Word of God. But the Bible says, Jesus said, I will build my church. He said, I'll build my church, singular. And so when we're talking about what Jesus said that He was planning on doing and what He actually did, is that He built His church. He is the one who owns it, and He is the one who said that it would be One, it would be singular in nature. Now, let's turn to the book of Ephesians. The Apostle Paul, he had some things to say. In chapter number 1, verses 20 through 23, we read these words. That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. You see, Paul tells us who is doing the working in Christ by raising him from the dead. If you back up to verse number 17, the Bible says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of Him. He makes it known that it's the God, the Lord, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father. Now, according to verse 19, God has immeasurably great power and great might allowing Him to raise Christ from the dead. That's not our purpose tonight to deal with the resurrection and, and whether or not God could do that. We're going to accept the fact tonight that He did raise Jesus from the dead. And, and there's something that is stated in this passage that has to do with the church that uh, is related to the fact that God raised Jesus from the dead. So let's look at a couple of questions. Question number one, as we look at this passage from the book of 1 Corinthians, or rather the book of Ephesians, is Jesus the head over all things to the church? Now if we go back and, and we look at uh, uh, verse number 22, He put all things under His feet and gave Him as head over all things to the church. And so when we look at that passage, when we answer this question, it's quite simple to answer. Is Jesus the head over all things to the church? 
Yes, that's what Paul says. That's the thing that he lets us know that he by inspiration tells us in regard to Jesus. Now, here's question number two in verse 23. The church is called Christ's what? Again, as you go back to to verse number 22, he speaks about the church. He gave him to be the head over all things to the church. And then in verse 23, he says, which is something. Now, what is it that Paul says that the church is? Paul says the church is his body. That is, he's talking about Christ. And so the answer to our question is the church is called Christ's body. Now, that's a significant thing. That's something that is important. Now, let me call your attention back to our previous question and and what is stated in the verse. The Bible says Jesus is the head over all things to the church, and the church is His body. A body without a head is incomplete, is it not? Uh, a body without a head is is considered dead, would it not be? When a head is severed from a body, we uh, we know that there can't be life in that body. But now we've got the body and we've got the head, according to what Paul writes for us here in the book of Ephesians chapter number 1. And, and so, you know, again, as we look at these things and and we try to determine what the Bible has to say about the church, these things are not rocket science. They're quite simple as God has revealed them to us. Uh, sometimes we may have a problem in accepting the things that God has to say, but they are indeed quite simple. Let's go to the book of Ephesians again, chapter 4 at verse number 4 this time. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 4. Let me ask you again to get your copy of God's Word and read along with us. Paul writes in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 at verse 4 these words. He says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. Now let's jump right into the questions on this one and, and, and let's look and let's try to answer them. Here's question number one. Is there only one hope? Now look again at the passage. I hope you have it open in, in, in your uh, Bible. But no, notice near the end, he says that you are called to one hope. Is there only one hope that we read about here? Yes. The answer would have to be yes. That's what Paul says. It's pretty plain, isn't it? Question number two. Is there only one Holy Spirit that is spoken about here? We'll look at uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 4. And again, near the beginning of the passage, he said, and one Spirit, okay? One Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit. And so, is there only one Holy Spirit? The answer to that, according to Paul, is yes. But here's question number three. Is there one body? Now, look again. Ephesians 4.4 4, There is one body. Is there only one body? Is there one body? The answer to that, of course, is yes. Question number four. According to this passage, if there is only one body and the body is identified as the church... How many churches are there? Let that sink in for a moment. If the passage says there is one body and the body is identified in the same book, chapter 1, as the church, then how many churches are there? And we're not talking about how many congregations there are of people who meet in different places. We're talking about how many churches are there are. And, and the answer to that, when we look at it and we think about it and we come to understand it, it has to be one. Now let, let's relate something back that we've already noted here in our study tonight. How many churches, question number five, how many churches did Jesus tell us he was going to build in Matthew chapter 16 at verse number 18? Remember he said, I will build my 
church, singular. You see, Jesus says that He's going to build one church. That's quite significant for us. It's something that we need to think about, contemplate, study about, and come to understand from the Word of God exactly what God wants us to know about His church and the oneness of it. Let's go to another passage. Let's go to the book of John, chapter 17, and let's look together at verses 20 and 21. John 17, verses 20 and 21. There the Bible says, I do not ask for these only. This is Jesus praying. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now, according to the context of this passage, it's the night Jesus is arrested and uh, and, and then subsequently crucified on the next day. And so what we're looking at here is seemingly before Jesus prayed His famous prayer of, uh, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. He, he prayed this prayer. And, and, and these words that we just read from the book of John, chapter 17, are a part of that prayer that Jesus is praying that night. Now, here's a question that just begs to be answered from this passage. Did Jesus pray that His followers all be one? Isn't that exactly what He said to His Father as He's praying to Him that night? I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in Me through their word. We do come to believe on Christ through His, through the words of the apostles. We've looked at the chain of authority. And then He said in verse 21 that they may all be one. Not just the ones who were there during that night. Not just the ones who would believe in the first century the words that the apostles spoke. But the ones who would read the words of these apostles and come to believe in Jesus because of the things that they have written. And so Jesus in that passage, He prays that all of His followers may be one. And so as we look at the question again, did Jesus pray that His followers all be one? The answer to that has to be yes. He prayed for His followers to be one. Let's go to the next passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 10. Again, the Apostle Paul writing here, he said, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, what's happening in this passage? Well, what's happening is that Paul is confronting a problem that he lays out for us in verse number 12. Now, now, we just read verse 10, but if we drop down to verse number 12, we find the problem that Paul is confronting. He says there in verse number 12, What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. As we look at this church, the church at Corinth, we understand that these Corinthian Christians were choosing up sides. They were segregating themselves into various groups. In other words, they were denominating themselves. Now, what does it mean to denominate something? The word means to give a name to to denote or to designate. And so what these folks were doing is they were designating which of these men of God, which of these preachers they had chosen to follow. Some followed Paul, some followed Apollos, some followed Peter, Cephas. And then there were some who simply said, I follow Christ. Now, as we look at this passage, Paul 
Paul pretty clearly says that he is demanding of them something. Uh, he is he is saying to them that he wants them to agree and that there be no divisions among them. Is that not what he said? But they be united and, and united in the same mind and in the same judgment. That is quite important. Now let's go to some questions. As we look at this passage, is religious division condemned in this passage? Isn't that exactly what the Apostle Paul is doing? Don't be choosing up sides. Don't be segregating yourselves. Don't be denominating yourselves. And so, is religious division condemned in this passage? Yes. Uh, there's no other way that we can read that passage. Question number two. Since religious division is condemned, and since Jesus prayed that all of His followers be one, must we strive to be one religiously? Again, let that question sink in to your mind. Since religious division is condemned in this passage, we just said that it was, and since Jesus prayed that His followers be one, that's back in John 17 that we just looked at a moment ago, must we strive to be one religiously? Now remember, when Jesus prayed, He prayed not only for the apostles there and the ones who would hear them, but those who would believe because of their word, whether spoken or written today. So the answer to that question is yes. We should strive to be one religiously. Now, here's question number three. Does Paul teach it's okay for a person to say, well, I believe my way and you can believe your way? Again, let me call your attention to this passage. He said that we are to be not be divided in, in matters uh, of judgment. We're not to be uh, divided in matters of uh, opinion and these things, and, and and not even doctrine. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. Does Paul say it's okay if we say, well, I believe my way and you believe your way? No, he doesn't teach that here, does he? Let's go to the next passage. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. Same apostle, the apostle Paul. He writes these words. And he, that is Christ, is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Now, Paul makes it clear in verse 13 that he's writing about God's beloved Son, Jesus Christ. And when he wrote, He is the head over all things, he's referring to Jesus Christ. Now, we've already seen in our study tonight that Jesus is said to be the head of the body, the head of the church. Jesus is to be preeminent, he said at the end of that passage, what does it mean to be preeminent? The word translated preeminent here means to be the first, to have superior status, or to be ranked number one. Now, since Jesus is the head of the church, the body, uh, should we go to any other than Jesus and the inspired writers of the New Testament to learn the organization, worship, and name of His church? Now, that's our question for this passage. It's somewhat long, but let me read it again. Since Jesus is the head of the church, the body, should we go to anyone other than Jesus and the inspired writers of the New Testament to learn the organization, worship, and name of His church? And the answer to that is no. As we close tonight, we're going to continue our study next week by considering 
uh, some additional things the Bible has to say about the church, and in particular next week about the organization of the church that we read about in the New Testament. But, but until then, I, I pray that you will continue to carefully contemplate the things that we've discussed tonight, the things that, that we've seen from the Word of God. Not what I said. We read it from the Bible. And, and, and as we think about those things, think about the fact that Jesus promised to build His church, singular. Think about the fact that the Bible says, teaches us that the church is called Christ's body, and He is the head of that body. Think about the fact that there, there are as many bodies as there are hopes and Holy Spirits. And the number is one. Think about Jesus prayed for His followers to be one. Think about the fact that Paul taught that we're to strive to be one religiously. Think about Jesus is the one to whom we must go for our answers regarding His church and every aspect of His church. Again, as we close tonight, maybe, maybe you'd like to study more on an individual basis and, and, and we would love for you to let us know your uh, request. We'd love for you to contact us and, and just let us know that you'd like to study one-on-one, -on -one, study more from the Bible. And we'd be more than happy to, to set that up for you and uh, do that at a time that's convenient for you. Uh, you can email us at BibleStudy at MidwayCofC.com with your request. And we would love to uh, set some time up with you. You can message us on Facebook. Go to Midway Church Jasper and on Facebook. Look us up. We have a uh, a Facebook page for the church. And so look us up and send us a message and, and, and we'll get back with you in order to, to try to set up a time that is suitable for you and, and for us to be able to, to, to look at the Word of God together. If you have a desire to do that, please don't hesitate to let us know. Let's close with a prayer. Holy and righteous Father in heaven, again, we're so thankful that we can come before your throne. Father, tonight, we're thankful for your church, for your plan from eternity in the past to, to establish this church, this important uh, organization that you have planned in your infinite wisdom. And Father, we pray that as we study about it from your word, that we'll accept what Your Word has to say, not what anyone else teaches us, but what we find in Your Word, so that we can be right with You. And Father, as, as we look at these things, may we have the courage to, to come to be obedient to the things that we learn in Your Word. Father, continue to be with Your church here on this earth. Be with the, the Midway congregation that we might reach out to others and, and help those in our community and throughout the world. Father, we're mindful tonight of some who are sick. We're mindful of some who have undergone surgeries and procedures. And we pray that you'll look down upon them and bless them as only you can. Father, as we close tonight, again, we are so thankful for your richest blessings toward us. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah, hide the glory, revive us again.